Thanks so much for joining us for today's Women Investing in New York Roundtable. We are excited to celebrate Women's History Month and foster growth of women's representation in startup investing. I see a lot of familiar faces, but also a lot of new ones as well. So to introduce myself, my name is Katie Hester. I'm the Investor Network Manager here at Launch New York. And today we're going to kick off our discussion interactively with a poll. So let me launch that poll now. You should see the poll on your screen. And we're asking, what is your experience with startup invest with investing in startup companies? So we'll just help us get a better gauge on understanding everyone who's joining us here today. So we're able to tailor our discussion. Please take a quick, a quick poll and we'll share the results shortly, but we'll leave this poll up for a few minutes while I just go over some, some intro notes. All right, so today's session, uh, we'll start with the poll that I just launched, and we'll talk a little bit more about Launch New York, who we are, what we do, and we'll jump right in then to welcoming our awesome panelists who are here joining us today, and then get into our discussion, which will be the bulk of our session today. How to participate, we just ask that you please mute your microphones if you're not speaking. We encourage you to submit questions in the chat throughout the discussion, and then we'll weave them into the conversation. And lastly, just stay tuned for our follow-up email. We'll, we'll include all the resources we discussed today and how to engage with Launch New York further. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Marnie, our moderator for today's session. Take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Katie. Uh, if we want to advance to the next slide, uh, we're thrilled to welcome so many folks here. I'm Marnie Levine, President and CEO and Fund Manager and, and Co-Founder of Launch New York. Uh, we're thrilled that so many of you wanted to get involved in this topic, and I'm loving seeing this live poll here, because uh, it does look like we're pretty evenly split among folks who have never invested in startup companies um, relative to those who've invested. And we see a nice split there between direct investment as well as uh, via participation in uh, pooled funds. So we'll be jumping into a lot of that with this amazing panel that we've assembled here um, with the great work of Katie Hester, our manager for our investor network. Thanks so much, Katie. And you know it's very fitting. We're wrapping up Women's History Month right now. So we're thrilled uh, again that you know we could just gather everybody as we we think about uh, the rest of 2024 and your journey in considering and participating in uh, investing in startups. One of the big questions that always arises is, am I an accredited investor? So that is one of the questions that we asked. And what we do find is a number of folks um, don't have any reason that they would know what that definition is. So just in brief, a definition of an accredited investor uh, is essentially a few items that you can uh, check that box and you you are then considered an accredited investor. There is not a uh, formal uh, form or certification process that you fill out once you start investing. There are often some items that you are uh, participating in to show accreditation or at least self-report um, uh, that. But essentially, Accredited investors are individuals uh, with $200,000 or more in annual income uh, for the past two years and for the foreseeable future, or as a couple that is a $300,000 threshold, or, so it doesn't require all of these boxes, um, the or um, that you could fit is also a million dollars in net worth, not including your primary residence. Um, the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, in recent years has added another uh, uh, criteria that you could meet um, that would involve a variety of certifications for those in the financial management uh, world. So I won't get into the complexities of that, um, but I believe we are putting into the chat um, uh, a link so that you could look at that more directly. And one thing we'll talk more about with the panel is the fact that while you may not meet these requirements today, um, that is something that you may look to um, achieve in the future. Also, we'll talk about the fact that there are some uh, methods of investing in startups and in businesses uh, of various kinds for non-accredited investors, that is individuals who do not meet those requirements. So just wanted to 
um, comment that we'll we'll touch on each of those. So one thing we want to excite you about is the fact that uh, women can play a very special role in investing and. Uh, we certainly will talk about how the trends have been changing for women participation participating in this arena. And uh, I myself, among many others here, can talk about the fact that we were not necessarily always involved with this or had others showing us how to participate. Um, but here we are today. So again, as we kind of wrap up and move into our next portion, um, just want to comment. Thanks so much. We've had over 40 folks uh, chime in. And again, we're seeing a really nice uh, split among folks new to this arena, as well as those who are currently involved. So looking forward to um, your hearing some great comments, but also sharing your thoughts in chat, and then we will have open Q&A. Okay, so just a quick, uh, uh, hopefully, a <laughs> quick process just to let you know about Launch New York, since I think a number of folks are new. I, I see many familiar names and welcome to all of you. Um, but wanted to note that Launch New York has been around for over 10 years now as the most active uh, seed fund most recently in New York State in terms of volume of transactions. We operate uh, traditionally in the western half of New York State, but I'm pleased to tell you that more of our state has great innovators who want us to support them with our mentorship and seed capital. So we're not only uh, headquartered in Buffalo and serving Rochester, Syracuse in the Southern tier and all the urban and rural areas, but also we are now expanding eastward into the Albany area. So really looking forward to that. Um, very prolific group. I won't touch on all these details. We will be providing um, the, the slides and information for you after the session. But we have served over 1,500 startups who are all high growth potential. And so when we refer to startups, we are talking about companies with uh, revenue capability or at least a vision toward 10 million in annual revenues by years five to seven, even if they have, and usually do, only have uh, limited or maybe no revenues when we start working with them. We do serve over 350 companies each year, and that's how Launch New York's pipeline of investment opportunities comes to the fore. We've been very pleased to have a portfolio of uh, greater than 50% uh, underrepresented founders, and um, this is something that's actually been growing for us. And in fact, given our mission to serve uh, under-resourced areas and under-resourced entrepreneurs, we are pleased that over 70% of our companies are located in low to moderate income areas, which has actually qualified us as the only venture funding community development financial institution serving uh, and investing in uh, companies in New York State. So we've put out over $12 million in 94 companies since we started investing in 2016, and that has actually had a huge leverage effect in it, helping our companies attract an additional 30x from other funders. So how does this all work? Um, Launch New York really engages with companies across all industry sectors. So now um, our uh, portfolio companies now number 92 in particular from our funds with over 40% having women in the leadership or C-suite. And they have in fact actually received over 45% of Launch New York's capital. So these companies range from consumer products, uh, most recently, a, a plant-based uh, milk company led by Black woman founder called Eden Esk. We just made that investment um, last Friday, um, all the way to intellectual property intensive companies um, in climate tech and med tech and other areas. Next slide. Great. So uh, where do we play? Like I said, often little or no revenue. So we're typically working with these companies in what would be known as the pre-seed and seed stage and a few into the, the series A. Um, but generally the seed stage is, is where we're at. Companies generally are going to be reporting well below a million dollars in annual revenues at that point, if they have any. Um, and most of them are going to be maybe in an initial raise of six figures say anywhere from $200,000 to up to a million dollars. <throat> and they usually have a, just a handful of, of folks working in the company and may or may not have products in market yet at that time. So how do we keep the trains running? We do require mentorship at Launch New York. We are a venture development organization that really is mentorship first. So with over 40 entrepreneurs and residents serving 
um, these hundreds of companies who are looking to grow and, and get their products out there, um, we are able to get these companies to a place where they're ready to apply for investment capital, both from Launch New York as well as other funders. We know Launch New York will not be the only funder, and some of the folks uh, joining us today are co-investors with us, and we're thrilled about that. We're here to make sure there's an on-ramp for those yeah. located in our region to be able to grow their businesses here rather than having them die on the vine, those great ideas, or perhaps taking them elsewhere. In fact, it's happening right here in upstate New York. But we do uh, keep the trains running on a regular basis. So we are an organization that has rolling investment opportunities and um, considerations. So in fact, today we will have our weekly investment committee call from 3 to 4 p.m. Um, with our uh, terrific investment committee helping the companies work through what is essentially um, a pitch, uh, Q&A, and then we make a decision. So we're investing in anywhere from two to four companies a month from all of these investment programs. I won't go into great detail other than to tell you that um, we have over 400 accredited investors involved in what are pooled funds, as you know, LP fund one and two, as we call them. But then we also have deal by deal investor network that Katie manages. So we really are trying to meet investors where they're at. Yeah. And many of our investors also actually get involved in the mentorship um, as well as participating, uh, of course, on the capital side. So we're thrilled to be able to provide what is, uh, frankly, one of the most unique arrays of financing programs targeted exclusively at funding companies in upstate New York, uh, one of the most unique in the country. Okay, let's move on to the good stuff. Um, I, hopefully this gives you a bit of a background to the fact that it really does take an entire community of investors who are excited to be participating at various levels. So we're thrilled today to have um, I, I just an incredibly accomplished panel. Um, Elisa Miller out, founder and managing partner of Chloe Capital and wonderfully a member of Launch New York's Investor Network. Juliet Lawrence, a member of Gangels, Houston Angel Network, and Launch New York's Investor Network, as well as an entrepreneur in residence for Launch New York, which at least Miller Route has been as well. Um, and I am incredibly fortunate that Maggie Dorn, venture partner at Motley Fool Ventures, is also on the Launch New York board. And welcome to Mary Grow, managing partner for Bread and Butter Ventures, also a co-investor in a Launch New York portfolio company. And Holly Hubert, CEO of Global Security IQ and a member of Launch New York's Investor Network. And a little tip that you'll hear about soon, also a former um, FBI in up, based in upstate New York. So we are truly bringing a very diverse set of folks to the table here. So next, what I'm excited to do is actually let you hear from these amazing uh, panelists here who bring such a wealth of not only knowledge, but uh, very diverse backgrounds to how they got involved here. So what I'd love to do is actually ask each of the members of the panel to, uh, you know, to talk to us with a brief introduction. But let's uh, let's combine your introduction with your um, uh, affiliation, of course, but also your current involvement with startup investment investing. Um, your investment thesis and and how that thesis has uh, tied you to New York State startups. So I will offer it up to who whomever on the panel is excited to go first. I'm happy to go. Uh, thank you for the intro, Marnie. Um, you know, as you mentioned when you were walking through the panelists, um, I'm on the board of Launch New York, and it really is one of the. Um, greatest resources for capital for the 27 most Western um, counties of New York State. But beyond that, you support startups that are all over New York State through um, just, you know, the message and the education programs that you you and the team have been putting out there. Um, but so yes, I'm Maggie Dorn. I'm actually located in Buffalo, New York, but I've been working for a company that's headquartered in Washington, DC. I serve as the chief network officer at The Motley Fool, which is an investing and in financial services company that really helps people around the world achieve financial th freedom through investing. Um, the Motley Fool is predominantly known for investing in the public markets, but uh, we actually launched a venture fund back in 2018, where I serve as a venture partner. 
Um, Motley Fool Ventures is a sister company of The Motley Fool, and we are a traditional venture firm where we have LPs, investors, and we invest on their behalf in, in really exciting startups. Um, I, I as, as a venture partner, I help with deal flow, I help with uh, fundraising, portfolio support, and you know anything in between. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, I serve on Launch New York, which has really been um, an incredible experience over the last I think five years or so, um, Marnie and the team have done a tremendous job in um, growing the venture ecosystem in Western New York. Thanks so much, Maggie. And uh, again, we're thrilled that uh, one of the companies we're featuring on our investor network right now, uh, uh, Motley Fool is uh, an investor in that company. That's right on. Right here in upstate New York. So yeah. thank you for that. And I probably should um, continue with the second part of that question. I apologize. I, I took right. a pause. But um, as I mentioned, we we invest in early stage startups um, at Molly Fool Ventures, um, but we're typically the stage right after Launch New York. So after they've raised their what's called a seed round, um, they go on to raise their Series A and beyond rounds. And that really is um, a point in the startup's life stage where they're, they, they have a great um, business, they um, understand the model, they have a, a um, group of, of repeat customers, and they are really looking for growth. Um, so we invest typically at the Series A and Series B stages um, with room for follow-on, which means um, future investments in that company. Um, our general investment thesis is around digital transformation of business. Um, but the core industries that we typically invest in are health tech, fintech, prop tech, ad tech and uh, the future of work. However, we're open to exploring other industries um, as long as we can clearly see our value proposition. And how the Motley Fool, or how Motley Fool Ventures um, ties into New York State startups is that we are not beholden to any geolocation at all. We can invest around the world. And we actually have a number of um, startups, um, successful startups that are based in New York State. Azuzu being one of them, Benny, Republic, Citus Health and Post Process, um, as well as I have two amazing investment team members that are based in New York City, Abby Mallon and, and Dylan Uprenda, who are both amazing uh, female investors. Awesome. Thanks so much, mm -hmm. Molly. Uh, Maggie, sorry. Um, okay, well, who would be ready to go next? Um, thrilled to hear about the company names and uh, know many others of you are invested uh, far and wide as well. So please jump in with your intro your uh, affiliation and your involvement in uh, startup investing connection to New York and that thesis. I'll, I'll go for it next. Marty, thanks so much. Uh, I'm Elisa Miller out, a managing partner at Chloe Capital. I am based in Ithaca, New York. And yes, proud to have multiple connections to launch New York, as Marty mentioned. I was previously an entrepreneur in residence there, also part of the investor network, which is awesome. And also a co-investor uh, with several launch New York companies. Um, in fact, some of whom were on the call. So like shout out to Sheer Share, who's on the call here today. It's both a, a Chloe and launch New York uh, portfolio company and see some other great portfolio companies in the call here as well, like My Wellbeing. So shout out. Um, thanks for joining today. And then um, a few other quick hats I wear, and I'll give a little bit about my background and the thesis at Chloe Capital. Um, I'm also, a, I serve as an advisor um, with New York State, with the with NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, where I work on a program for startups called the Climate Justice Fellowship that also serves other types of climate tech organizations. But, but for the investors and startups on the call, you can also participate. Um, so you can check that program out as well. And then also I serve as a mentor with the National Science Foundation and the Innovation Core Program. And as an entrepreneur in residence with at Cornell University uh, here in Ithaca as well. Um, so a little bit about my background. I am an entrepreneur, an investor. Um, I'm a mother. I have two amazing daughters and my two dogs as well, who are my sons. Um, and I am also an ecosystem and community builder. Um, my earlier career included over a decade as a CEO and co-founder of a global software services 
firm um, with several software product spin outs as well. And I have founded seven companies at this point, and I've built a portfolio of 65 companies that I've invested in both as an angel and a VC. Um, and I've overseen 12 M&A transactions across that portfolio, including a recent $100 million exit. Um, and, um, and of course, I'll talk a little bit about Chloe Capital and our thesis as well, and our focus on New York State as well. So Chloe Capital is an investment firm that invests with a mission of inclusive ecosystem building at scale. Uh, we do invest all across the country, and we also operate accelerator programs in over a dozen cities around the U.S. We do have a very strong New York State presence. We're both headquartered in Ithaca, New York. Uh, we have team members all across New York State, including in Buffalo and in New York City, um, in addition to some team members in other parts of the country as well. Um, and then we also have about 35% of our portfolio in New York State as well, just due to our uh, significant presence here. And then our accelerator programs have, um, have taken place in Rochester, in Binghamton, um, in Ithaca, as well as um, in New York City. Uh, we have a program active right now. Uh, so in fact, you can join us if you're <laughs> heading to the city. You can join us on May 30th for our showcase uh, for that accelerator there. Um, and we invest in diverse women-led uh, tech companies that are support that are all across the country, but that are um, solving some of the world's biggest problems and that are typically at the seed stage. Um, I'll pause there because I know we have a lot of folks to go through, but that's just a little bit about me and Chloe Capital and excited for the conversation today. Thanks so much, Elisa. Okay, Julia, Mary, Holly. I'll, I'll go next. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Juliet Lawrence. I live in Houston, Texas. So thank you, New Yorkers, for allowing me to, to jump in on this call and, and join the conversation on this very important topic. Um, as was mentioned, I am an angel investor and I'm a member of a lot of different networks um, just to help me get a lot of deal flow and to learn from more experienced investors. So Houston Angel Network, Angels, Cap Table Coalition, Institute for, Inst for Inter Entrepreneurial Leadership. Um, and I also serve on a couple of committees uh, for the Angel Capital Association. Um, got my undergrad at USC and something that I, I don't even do right now, right? <laughs> got an MBA at U of M uh, with a focus in finance and strategy. And after I graduated, I spent 10 years working in um, corporate finance in various areas. I was in treasury, strategic planning, um, business finance, and even had a short stint in executive compensation. Um, my last role was as the finance director of chloroacolide vinyl um, uh, for, for Dow. So a lot of finance experience. So that actually translates into my investment thesis, or I would say maybe my investment process. So I've been an angel investor for a little over a year now. So that thesis, the, the way that I invest is still evolving. Um, but I will say I would uh, look at the way that I invest as being industry agnostic. I'm geographically, ge uh, geographically um, agnostic as well, which is why I've invested in, in New York companies, California, Houston companies. Um, I'm really looking for a product that is that resonates with me as a consumer or with me as a professional, as a finance professional or someone that has been in the chemicals manufacturing industry for um, over 10 years. I'm looking for a business that is scalable, that will produce a large return on investment because let's be honest, you know, in addition to supporting uh, founders through coaching, through, through um, financial investments, we also want a return uh, on, on, our, on our deployed funds. Um, lastly, I'll say what I've found now, I'm, I'm starting to also focus on um, the founder, their passion for uh, their business, and also their attention to the financials, because I spent 10 years there, and I want to hear about profitability and, and revenue and growth and things of that nature. I'll pass it on to you, Marty. Great. So, all right, Holly, Mary. Yes, I'd be glad to jump in here. So hello everyone, great to be with you today. My name is Mary Grove and I'm a managing partner at Bread and Butter Ventures based here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I did live in New York City for five years. So I have a special connection, uh, love New York and love the state of New York and glad to be investing there as well. So quick bit about Bread and Butter Ventures. So we are a seed stage focused firm based here in Minnesota, invest all across the country. And we really lean into our location as our core advantage. So we lean into, we call the Minnesota home field advantage is investing in the core sectors of healthcare, the food system, 
and enterprise SaaS more broadly because Minnesota is home to the highest concentration of Fortune 500 companies per capita in the nation, in particular in those sectors. So our model is to partner with, we have 17 Fortune 500 and large enterprises who are formal partners of our of our firm and then support companies in really unique ways after we invest from all across the country. So to date, we have 71 companies in the portfolio nationally. Of those companies, half of them are led by female founders. Uh, 60% of them, six zero, have a founder who's a person of color and really passionate about trying to democratize you know, the playing field for who has access to capital. And within uh, New York, we have a number of, of companies as well. Uh, pleased to see Courtney and Dr. Tai of Shearshare here, a shared portfolio on the call. We have a better mind, a company called GenCove as well, and really see a lot of innovation happening truly all across the, the country. And so we are focused on that seed stage zero to one, you know, average check sizes is, is half a million to a million dollars and really love to partner with companies in that zero to one stage of, of a business. Uh, in terms of personal backgrounds, so I've spent the last two decades focusing on early stage tech uh, and, and early stage investing. So I was at Google for the first 15 years of my career, which was an incredible uh, experience. I worked on the IPO deal team when the company went public in 2004, then did early stage product, uh, biz dev and emerging market expansion for about six years, which is the skill set that I apply most closely to working with portfolio companies after we invest in that commercialization go to market. And then my last six years, I built the Google for Startups organization, which is the company's umbrella for looking at, you know, how to invest and support startups directly, but also startup ecosystems. And so really, really passionate about early stage and this notion that, you know, innovation is happening in all corners of the country and the world, not just the coastal hubs, but there's really an opportunity to bring more capital and bring more accessibility. So I'm also a mom to seven-year-old boy-girl twins who are the, the highlight of my, uh, of my world. And I'm really active in our communities too, with respect to uh, philanthropy. I serve on the boards of the Bush Foundation, the Minneapolis Foundation here in town, again, around that theme of accessibility to capital and to, uh, to resources. And so the perspective I bring is both uh, as a venture investor, managing a, a firm, but also as an angel investor too. So thrilled to be part of the conversation. Boy, I love hearing about uh, the many, many roles that make up who you are today and just hearing, okay, there's many places that your themes of who you are come together. So we'll, we'll talk about that more in a minute, but I want to turn it over to Holly to wrap up this first inquiry. Tell us about yourself and uh, the investing thesis, Holly. Well, well said, Marnie. Um, I'm very humbled to be with such an esteemed panel. I've enjoyed listening to everyone's background. It's truly amazing. So I look forward to getting to know all of you. Um, I think Marnie mentioned that I'm a retired FBI agent. I'm actually from Western New York, but I was pretty lucky to be sort of all over the, uh, the country. The FBI is a global organization. And before I got in, I was uh, a, a systems engineer at a big computing installation. And so I was lucky to be in on the ground floor of cyber when that was becoming a crime, uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And so in retirement, I think it was natural for me to found, a, I, I only ever wanted to be an FBI agent or have my own business. So I'm lucky to have uh, started my own business on cybersecurity, which has been really fun. And uh, the, the company's based in New York, but like the FBI, my clients are really all over the world. I have a lot of national uh, contracts. And so I meet a lot of interesting people and that's really how I got in, uh, started in investing. And then I, I've, I've weirdly known Marnie for 20 years and then I bumped into her again in the startup ecosystem and uh, was very proud of the work she's doing in launch. And so I, I got involved with launch to complement some of the other investments that I've been doing really out of state. And uh, um, I love the investment thesis overall of launch in that almost half are uh, minority and up underrepresented female founders. And so I think that's amazing. And it lines up with me wanting to give back to Western New York. You're up and down the throughway, Marnie, and I'm, I'm very impressed by that. And so my, my investment thesis is maybe just a, a, a hair different because I don't know if it's ADD or what, but I'm just interested in everything. So for me, I wanna know first, does this organization creatively or innovatively solve a problem that I'm interested in? 
And so if I think they solve a problem that interests me, then I'm then I'm interested in listening to how they go about it. And then I have to look, the FBI agent will always be with me. I have to look at the people and the invest in the and the team that that make the company up and do those do those horses, so to speak. Can they get it done? And so I'm always looking at their um, ability to take feedback. Who are they working with? Another great thing about launch is launch uniquely provides a mentor for uh, uh, founders and teams. And so I think that's amazing. Does does that does that uh, founder system have a network to help them get started? And then I um, I, I rent space. I have nothing to do with UB, but I rent space. From the UB Foundation, so they seem they're the the Center for, for Entrepreneurship here at, at UB. They send all these kids to me, so I I get a lot of I hear a lot of interesting ideas, and so I'm always I feel good about giving back and helping mentoring some of these. They're not just pre stage or C stage; they're no stage, but they have an idea, and so I help them like early, early, early find Marnie and others, and so that's just fulfilling for me to give back. Thanks so much, everybody, for the reflections here. So I, given that we have so many participants today who haven't invested yet, I think um, that moment or that period of time or that step in your journey where you move from not being an investor to being an investor is really an important one for people to reflect on. And some of you have touched on it a little bit. And I'll, I'll, I'll maybe kick off this portion to note that I, I was not... Um, I didn't know what an accredited investor was either back in the day. But as I was part of trying to build the new economy in upstate New York, particularly in the life sciences area, I said, gee, if I'm trying to convince investors to support these companies with their dollars, I need I need to get in the game myself, um, eat my own dog food, as they say. So I um, myself did not have role models of being around investors um, I was not involved in stock market or finance like Juliet. I absolutely was not involved there, but seeing that our companies really were struggling despite uh, even many cases having good attraction to get dollars uh, in upstate New York, you know, definitely wanted to jump in. So my first steps were with Buffalo Angels and being able to see how the process could work. Um, and angel groups are often a way that people will get involved. So I would say for me, it was a, a feeling like I see these amazing inventions and it really breaks my heart that they are not leaving the lab and getting out into the hands of the world. And that was motivating me with startups I had done prior that were venture backed. You know, I didn't lead the fundraising, but I saw that those dollars could really turn these amazing ideas into something that improved people's lives, not just even locally, but all around the globe. So it motivated me to start going down that path and ultimately creating what I described earlier is what Launch New York does today. So I'm wondering if each of you could give a reflection on, you know, all of these individuals thinking, is this something I would do? You know, what was that like for you? And, and, where were you in your journey uh, professionally and personally that made that something that you wanted to do? I will note my husband has no particular interest in investing in startups or otherwise. So um, this was definitely something that came from more of my professional experience and my love of upstate New York. So would love to hear your uh, your stories. Okay, ladies. Don't be I'm happy to kick it off again. <laughs> Thanks, um, yeah, I mean, I actually had a very similar experience to you when we were launching our venture fund at Motlifo Ventures. I felt like I needed to have the skin in the game if I was going to be, you know, trying to fundraise as well as, you know, enter entertaining potential portfolio companies and meeting founders that we wanted to invest in. I needed to to basically show that I was I was committed to this fund. So that was my first foray into investing in a venture capital fund. Um, but kind of like, you know, bigger picture, so much has changed since 2018 in terms of accessibility for people. Um, I think anyone who's considering um, investing in the private markets, I think the first step that you want to do is kind of similar to your first step is to find a um, group like Buffalo Angels um, or launch New York with, with the fund too, as well as the investor network. 
um, as well as something like Republic, uh, which is a platform for angel investors to get involved. Gangels is a great example, too, that Juliet's involved with. These angel networks that are communities that, um, you know, are investing in exciting businesses. Um, I think the number one, uh, I guess, the number one thing that any person should keep in mind, ma man or woman, um, should be that their values and their vision aligns with the fund manager and the group. Um, or if you're investing directly into a company, um, you know, kind of to what both Holly and Juliet were highlighting, um, really understanding the business and industry and the problem um, and having high conviction that this business can be um, something uh it can grow to grow to be something big because angel investors are essentially investing in very, very early stage, which makes, you know, the risk profile of those investments a little bit higher. And there's a longer time horizon um, to uh, potentially getting your money back and, and the gain. So I think if you can have that vision and value at the core of every single, you know, private market investment that you make, you'll be able to sleep better at night. So good answers. I, I could add to that because um, I don't have a finance background from investing. Just being an FBI agent, I think I am that to the core and always will be. But I was lucky when I was a little kid, my grandfather was always into saving and put your money in the bank and invest it. And then certainly my parents were too. And as a young person getting involved with the 401k and understanding even what those options are. So those that safe index type of investing. And then, you know, in this company, I've really only been in this company seven years and um, I've been lucky to generate some revenue. So I, I felt responsible to give it back to the people that gave it to me. I wanted to, to share what I earned with companies right here in Western New York. And um, I did early on look for like angel networks or, you know, I really didn't know a lot of people. I knew Marnie this whole time, but I didn't know where she was and didn't put it together until after I found her again. But um, um, without mentioning any names, I did look at a couple investor networks and they were a little stodgy, a little proper, a little old, a little, you know, elderly white male and um, not understanding tech. And so there was a gap. So I think, Maggie, your point about being with individuals with your same values and, and your same outlook on life, I think Launch New York is certainly more forward leaning and hip. And I think some of the funds are like I would imagine Chloe Capital is, too. And um, uh, I seem to fit in better in Launch. And um, it's it's uh, an easy way to start learning how to invest because of, I think, the screening that you do, Mari. And um, again, that I like the mentor being assigned. But, you know, ultimately, when you decide to invest in something, it's risky. So you have to think whatever this X dollar amount you're considering to invest in, you have to consider, I might lose this and I'm I okay with losing all of it. And so it's, it's a complement to your traditional index fund investing that you've done all your life. So this is to me a way to di diversify your, your portfolio. And again, it's risky, but then the returns are great. And then sometimes it's a little philanthropic too. Like I, you know, like you're there, the chance of a certain individual of making it are really slim, but I just want to give back and help. So there's that too. <laughs> I love that, Holly, and I'll dive in on this as, as well real quick here, which is um, I, I love the idea of, you know, using this as an opportunity to diversify your existing portfolio as well. And I think so many people don't know about it. Like many of you on the call, I didn't um, I didn't learn about this mode of investing until a little later in life. And I spent years as part of my journey um, working with startups in a lot of other capacities, whether it was mentoring them, helping build uh, software infrastructure for startups. Uh, working with accelerator programs and competitions and other other you know ecosystem building kinds of initiatives, um, but I was really excited when I was able to start um, start adding that capital component because, like many of you, I realized uh, how incredible the opportunity was to serve all these 
um, diverse women leaders who were being overlooked, even though they were really overprepared and overqualified, um, being overlooked by the traditional systems. Um, so I'll use this question as a way to just address a couple of the tools I've used uh, to make investments that I think are things that maybe people don't always know about or don't always realize are opportunities available to them. Uh, so one is that I started in my kind of investing journey as, a, as an angel investor, doing a couple of things. One was equity crowdfunding uh, campaigns. So that's one opportunity open to both accredited and non-accredited investors on platforms like WeFunder, Republic, Start Engine, places like that, where you can go and actually just invest a few hundred dollars, even if you're a non-accredited investor, but you can still start getting involved in that startup journey, right? Um, and, and actually getting returns if some of those companies end up doing well. Um, another thing I started doing was using my self-directed IRA to make investments um, directly into startups. And that's something not everyone realizes either, is that you can use some of that money that's just sitting there in your IRA that you might have all invested in the public stock market. Um, while I wouldn't recommend anyone put all of their money into startups. It is still a very high risk, high roller kind of category. But um, but a good rule of thumb is, you know, anywhere from maybe 5% of your portfolio or something, money that you can definitely afford to lose um, should absolutely be going towards uh, privately held companies um, if possible. And if you're obviously, if you're a more sophisticated investor, you could even go up to like five or 10% of your portfolio. Um, you know, if this is something that you really do want to do uh, you know, to, at a greater level. Um, so that's something I set up as well to make those small investments into startups that I was mentoring uh, directly. And then um, a couple other tools that people sometimes don't realize too is that um, you can do this through a syndicate or a special purpose vehicle to invest alongside other people. And that's another way to write sort of a smaller check, but still invest alongside others. What Marnie has done with Launch New York is actually a perfect example of that with the investor network, where you can kind of join with some smaller checks that will get aggregated alongside other investors. So you can write a smaller check into a startup or into, you know, or, or even sometimes in some cases, smaller checks into a fund through an SPV. Um, and um, you can set those up also with other, um, you can set up syndicates either with an attorney or with platforms like AngelList as well, um, as well as platforms like Loon Creek that will assure that will help you kind of set those up to invest alongside others. And then just finally, I'll mention some other things I've taken advantage of too. I set up several SPVs and that was actually how I got started with Chloe as well was by starting these SPVs that invested alongside our accelerators. And special purpose vehicle just means a special company just set up to, for the purpose of making an investment or a group of investments. Um, and then um, donor advised funds is the final thing I'll mention here really quickly because uh, we were talking about kind of opportunities for accredited and non-accredited investors. And this is another place where people don't realize they can invest is through using some of your philanthropic capital as well that you might be setting aside to. There's many, many women are very philanthropically minded. They are, you know, actively donating to nonprofits and charities involved in boards. And, um, and so many folks don't realize that with a donor advised fund, you can make multiple different kinds of investments out of that, not just invest in public markets, but you can also invest both directly in companies, you can invest in funds, um, you can also um, use some of the, the actual grant dollars in that to put money towards certain nonprofit vehicles that can also be invested in funds and startups. There's a lot of options out there. So happy to do a deeper dive with anyone who's interested in that topic another time, but want to put it out there because it's available to both accredited and non-accredited investors at amounts as low as sometimes $5,000. Um, so just some good options to know about things that I've taken advantage of in my, as I was getting started in my investing journey. Thanks. And two quick questions in the chat that perhaps we can weave into our discussion while we're talking here. One is from Katie, which is what industries are you seeing the highest request slash growth? Uh, she is most interested in financial and healthcare sectors. And then there's another more note in the chat about curious about AI driven startups and in initiatives or investment opportunities there. So We'll just weave them in. Yeah, maybe if um, Mary and Juliet want to uh, comment and weave that in a bit. Sure, sure. Oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Mary. Thanks, Juliet. Uh, just a couple kind of themes to touch on and we'll weave into some of that as well, given and healthcare is a big, big focus of ours at Bread and Butter too. I think on the investing side of, you know, why venture, what was the personal journey, really being involved in it from the periphery at a big institution, it's, thinking about the, the urgent need for systems level change in the venture industry, right? Growing up and working in Silicon Valley for so long, there's so much magic to it. And there's so much about the industry that 
you know, we really need systems level change. And if you look at the fact that, you know, women represent 80 plus percent of the purchasing power, healthcare decision making in households today, yet when you look at the who's allocating and who's receiving capital, it's totally flipped, right? So we see that the data from the Harvard Kennedy School showed recently that 11, only 11 percent of allocators at venture firms are female. And you look at who's receiving funding, right? 13% of venture capital dollars go to companies led by, that didn't include a female founder. If you narrow that lens to specifically exclusively female run, that number drops to 2% of venture capital dollars, right? So we have this incredible gap between the opportunity gap. And we know that the tidal wave of change that happens when women fully participate in the innovation economy is extraordinary. And so one of the things that you know, I was really motivated by working at some of these large platforms, um, getting in the game directly to try to be a part of that, that transforming that entire stack of the venture industry. And so um, I think a couple of things to think about, you know, from, a, from an angel perspective, though, if you're looking at getting involved in investing for the first time, it's a really exciting high risk, high reward asset class. And, you know, keep that in mind as well. If you are not yet an accredited investor or, you know, knowledge is power. So I'm really glad that you're in this conversation and conversations like these, think about getting involved with accelerator programs, going to demo days, rolling up your sleeves, right? Mentoring companies, maybe joining some of them in an advisory capacity and getting equity that way and really building up your uh, portfolio, so to speak, even a theoretical portfolio initially of what would I be doing? What would my thesis look like? How would I uniquely add value? How would I source deals that I would invest in and kind of start to really build that muscle um, before you even begin to, to formally invest is, is something that I um, find really valuable. Uh, and, and read, right? Get out there in the industry, Venture Deals, the book by Brad Feld is one of my favorites that I still reference periodically. There, there's constantly uh, updates with new anecdotes to that. And so um, I think to take a slight shift to talk about the question of AI and, and some of the industries like healthcare, healthcare just you know could not be a more imperative time to invest. I think the, the COVID pandemic really accelerated or exposed more of the vulnerabilities in our healthcare supply chain in a pretty broken system between patients, payers, providers, um, who pays is the fundamental question in the industry. And what we saw in 2020 and 2021 was a massive influx of funding going into digital health, right? 3X the, the average um, that we had seen before. And sadly, a lot of that funding is now pulling back. And so if you look at the I don't know the exact latest numbers I need to pull up, but it's roughly $28 billion of venture funding was the peak sort of four years ago. And last year, we ended the year at about $10 billion of funding into the digital health category. And so we're seeing a, a, it's tightening up in terms of companies getting access to funding, but the need is as urgent as ever. And so we continue to see uh, strong players in that space do really, really well, but it is a tight capital market in, in healthcare. Thanks so much, Mary. Juliet. Sure. Um, I, I'll go next with uh, speaking about my investment journey. And I feel like I'm uh, probably going to be the odd man out here in, in my journey in that um, it started decades ago and I really started from zero. I didn't know much about any type of investing, let alone uh, uh, angel or, or private investing. And so I started with uh, learning through community college courses, reading books um, about just investing in general, what's the financial world and, and started uh, investing in public markets. Uh, didn't have much, I started right after college. And so I was putting in maybe you know, $25, $30 a month um, into ETFs and then eventually uh, individual companies. That journey, that passion um, eventually led me to get my MBA with a focus in finance because I just loved investing so much and literally wrote in my essay, I want to be a professional investor. Don't know what that means, but want to be a professional investor. And so when I got into to business school, um, came across treasury, which is a very technical area of business. And because of my personality, I said, well, I'm course, I've got to spend time in, in corporate finance and learn about income statements and balance sheets and statements of cash flows and all of that in order to eventually become a professional investor. Uh, my second role in, in corporate finance was with our pension group, and they were deploying a lot of capital, uh, several millions of dollars into alternative investments, which uh, private equity and venture capital, these types of investments fall underneath. Uh, and the more I heard them talking about 
these fund managers and talking about the exits and and just really exposing me to this space, I said, I need to, I need to learn more about this. So I dug in and then I was like, how, do, how can I invest in this? Right. I've got, I got my $25 a month. How, how can I make that happen? Um, and found out about the fact that you need to be an accredited investor in order to invest in this space. From that point, I, I dedicated a significant amount of my own personal time to learn about private investments, to learn about what it, takes to become an accredited investor, really focused on getting my career to a point where I would qualify as an accredited investor. And when I saw that I was getting close to that point, because I have a spreadsheet and I, I track my, my numbers every month, I decided that I wanted to get some, some targeted education and exposure to learn how to invest in this space once I became eligible. So I joined programs like Black BC, which is a intensive two week program that teaches you things like what's a cap table? Um, you know, what does it mean when you talk about, you know, just valuation and things of that nature. Um, I took an online course uh, with Venture Forward uh, to learn about the, the specifics of investing and feel more comfortable in that space. And when I was finally an accredited investor, I joined a lot of different groups to get that uh, deal flow uh, in order to invest. Now, one thing that I want to point out for those of you that are, that maybe have a, a story like mine, you're new, you're still learning. Um, generally, when you hear about angel investing, you're gonna hear minimum check of $25,000. Well, I can tell you I'm, I'm a year in and thinking of writing one check to one company for 25K, I just wasn't comfortable with that. So I started smaller. I started with 5,000, with $10,000 checks in, in companies um, just to, to learn more about, you know, how that even, what that even looks like uh, to invest in, in a company. Uh, and then, you know, eventually, uh, fingers crossed, right? Because this is a high risk area. I'll be moving into that space where, I'm, where I am uh, writing bigger checks. But for me, focusing on that education, getting comfortable, and then just jumping in there. Really appreciate the comments and, um, I, you know, we're going to be hitting the top of the hour and I can see there's lots of questions. Um, we will be putting resources into the chat here. Um, Angel Capital Association has full on courses if you really want to make a, yourself a student of this. Um, I know many of our um, programs represented here on the panel we do host educational sessions on specific topics, whether it's, you know, valuation of the company. Uh, we've all watched Shark Tank and you wonder how they come up with that percentage and the amount they're offering. Um, the entrepreneurs wonder too, and I can see many are on here. So we, we do want to give people an opportunity to get, uh, get that comfort level. Um, I'll just comment for myself. One thing I will say, because I often hear many angels who have invested in a number of companies and they kind of say, yeah, and I will admit usually it's the the um, other gender saying things like, um, my my wife is telling me I need to get an exit before I can invest in any more companies. Um, so there is a consideration of how much money can you put on the line and how long can you wait? Mm -hmm. um, the the timeframes are much longer now. Um, I did see a question um, from Nicole. Thanks for that about, you know, why is this a good time to get involved in angel investing? We're thrilled that women are starting to show up uh, and, and really growing and almost doubling the the uh, the representation among angel investors, although we're still relatively low among the decision makers on the VC side. Um, but I guess I, for myself, I think that there are groups like this now that are giving you alternatives. It, it used to be sort of the traditional angel group made up of the same typical group of financial industry folks um, where you're not necessarily comfortable. And I think Holly said that, where are you comfortable? Because you are learning and you're side by side with people and looking for people you trust. And you also have to decide for yourself, how much money can I risk? And how much do I want to learn? Do I want to know all the details or do I want to trust others, you know, to help make some of those decisions? So that's why having both options for direct investing as well as funds, I think really is a good thing for you to have available. Um, and I know folks on this panel would be willing to talk with anyone who's just kind of noodling this decision and saying, what do you think I should do next? Um, I know we'll, um, we're, we're heading in, into the final moment. So I really want to give each of the panelists a chance to kind of wrap up with any tips, tricks, um, recommendations, or just personal reflections uh, as we hopefully head into another one of these webinars soon, but Women's History Month is wrapping up. So uh, let us know your thoughts, folks. 
I will kick off this section again. Um, so there was, when I was preparing for this uh, webinar, um, I was thinking about this, you know, I'm sure everyone here today has heard about this massive wealth transfer that's about to happen. Um, $68 trillion in wealth is going to be transferred in the next year, in, in the next decade. And apparently, according to experts like McKinsey and others, the, a majority of this wealth is going to be in the hands of women. These are either widows or um, heirs that are, are, are going to be inheriting um, a massive amount of wealth. When I think about that, you know, um, obviously it creates a tremendous amount of opportunity for women to invest more, not just in the traditional equities markets, but also in alternatives such as private market investing. And I feel like the onus is on not just the potential investors and the women out there to really understand angel investing and investing in funds as well, but for the fund managers, the VC fund managers and the founders of these companies to really understand their potential investors and LPs, um, to understand their time horizons, again, to understand their values, um, you know, what's important to them, um, the, the vision that they have for, for the future world that we're creating, because that is essentially what we were doing when we were investing in founders and these startups is creating you know, the, the future that we envision and supporting it through, through our dollars. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I was just thinking about how we're so focused on, you know, the investor and really, I think the fund manager and the founders have um, a really great opportunity to, to truly understand who they're, this, this emerging group of um, investors are over the next 10 years. I'll just share another quick thought here as we wrap up as well, which is um, at Chloe Capital, we really talk a lot about what we call the founder to funder journey, which is all about, um, you know, having founders who then go on to have these um, bigger multi-million dollar and billion dollar exits. And then really those founders who are going to turn around and pay it forward to the next generation and uplift the next generation of women leaders. So I guess my, my takeaway for, for groups like this too is always to say, you know, think about this class of investing um, as a way for women to uplift other women, as well as for amazing, our amazing man ambassadors out there to uplift all the women in their lives as well. Um, and to see this as an incredible, you know, opportunity for folks to really um, support each other in this community um, and do that in a meaningful way. And then I think that's one way we can also make a much bigger exponential impact and really sort of uh, take advantage of this incredible opportunity to really transform the, the industry, the innovation industry, which ultimately will make it better for all of us, right? If we can have uh, more diverse innovation, we're going to have better solutions out there and um, we'll be able to create a better world for everyone um, as well. So thanks. Awesome. Uh, one Julie? thing I'll add is Mary? that, sure. One thing I'll add is that uh, there are many studies out there that show uh, they're, they focus on the public markets, but they show that women get better returns than men, right? <laughs> and I cannot help but, but believe that that translates into, you know, the private markets as well. Um, if I, if you don't leave with anything else, if you're, you're new to this and you're trying to figure it out, um, just know that you are capable and also believe in your own methodology, your own way of investing. Um, I, I can say I've been through a lot of due diligence calls with other more experienced investors and have asked for things like financial statements or projections and have gotten shut down by those investors saying that that's a dumb question. It's not a dumb question. And if it's something that you wanna learn, you have a right to ask for it. So as you go through this journey, just trust yourself, trust your gut um, and, and know that you're, you're capable of doing it. I'll just add a final final quick thought is that, you know, brilliant companies are started in all economic environments, and this one is no different. Uh, if you look at the last two recessionary periods, some of the greatest innovations were born in those times, right? And the, the venture funds from those vintage years significantly outperformed the years around it. So 2024, going to be a beast. 2025, likely too. And so it's a really great time to be deploying venture and to be getting into this asset class. And so hugely excited about the, the road ahead, despite the difficult macro that we've been living in for a little bit now. Um, and I wanna make myself and the bread and butter team available as a resource to all of you as well. I dropped a, a link in the chat, but on our website, um, you could book, we do open office hours every week with each member of our team. If you're interested in just a quick chat about um, 
venture or anything else. So thank you for, for including us. Terrific. And Holly, a final word? Just all brilliant points. Um, I, I, the, the thing that I would add is the camaraderie. I appreciate all the friendships and connections and the opportunities. Mary, you talked earlier about going into all these different groups and non-traditional ways of getting in. Elise, you talked about non-traditional ways of getting in and being an advisor. And I've been an advisor for companies and even recently became this, the chief information security officer for a startup called Credivault here in Western New York, which is a wire transfer, a secure wire transfer app, FinTech app. And so I'm grateful for these opportunities. And if I didn't jump in and get involved, I wouldn't even know the people that I'm, that I'm now working with and uh, sharing uh, wonderful conversations such as you all. So thank you. So thank you all. I really appreciate everybody joining. Katie, thanks for organizing. Um, Maggie, Elisa, Juliet, Mary, and Holly, you've really been awesome to share your reflections today. You're all super busy with the 8 million roles you're fulfilling, um, but this is how we do it, right? Women investors, women overall. Um, we'll look forward to being in touch with everybody as a follow-up, and uh, we definitely will be doing more uh, roundtables uh, going forward, but please take advantage of all the great offers and resources that so many of the panelists have offered today. Thanks everyone for participating and, uh, and have a wonderful rest of your week.